Um, a good evening to everyone. I welcome you to another edition for ECS 3701. And as usual, we just want to do some sound tests just to ensure that our sound is clear. So if you can hear our voice, you can hear our sound system, please just indicate in the chat, the chat box so that we can proceed. We don't want to waste much of your time today. We have a lot that we want to cover. So as soon as we uh, get the confirmation that the sound is okay, then we proceed, okay? I uh, can see uh, people are confirming that the sound is clear. So let's jump straight into it without much time wasting. Um, today, we want to cover um, uh, a lot of stuff. So just brace up for this, but it, it won't exceed two hours. So try to keep it within uh, one hour 30 to about two hours. Right? But if, if we can finish before then, then that will be good news. So let's get started now. Let's get started now, uh, sorry. Okay, so if you can see my slides, please just indicate. Just indicate so that. Revolutionary greetings, doctor. Uh, no, I cannot. What I am seeing, though, it is your. Um... Oh, there I see it. I see it. Sorry, I was seeing your WhatsApp now. Now I see this the the, the slides. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. So let's let's get started now. Slides are visible. Thank you very much, guys, for joining us and for sacrificing your time. You could be doing something different, but you have chosen to join uh, this episode for uh, monetary economics. This is an interesting subject because some of the aspects that we study here, they are practical and you can actually apply them. Although most of uh, the economic subjects, they are theoretical, but some of the theory can be applied in real life, right? So. We are not going to do a recap of what we covered last time. We're going to take it from where we left it. Okay. So, um, okay, let's look at the. Okay, we covered this. We covered it. Right. Today's session is mainly focusing on defining what man is. And then after that, we are going to move to the next learning unit four, learning unit five, and learning unit six, time allowing. So let's look at what is money. Everyone would come up with a, a definition, a, their own definition of what money is. But as economists, uh, we have a general way of defining money. Because as economists generally, we agree that uh, money is anything that is generally accepted in the payments for goods and services or in the payments of, in the repayments of debts. So we can understand that if we can use any asset or anything that is acceptable in settling payments, then we can refer to that as money. But by the end of this learning unit, you're going to see what constitutes money and what is not money, right? So let's see, uh, there is no single precise definition for money for economists, right? So the word money is frequently used synonymously with wealth, which is a stock and income, which is a flow of earnings. Right, I would want to make a distinction between what are stocks and what are flows. There is a difference in economics between flow, flows and stocks. A stock is something that is taken at a particular point in time, right? A flow is something that is measured per unit of time. You can think of income as someone's salary or someone's, um, okay, yeah, someone's salary. And then stock of wealth, we can say, at a point in time, right? How much wealth does someone have? But when you're looking at income, we are saying how much money or how much flow of income per month do someone get? So this one is measured per unit of, uh, of time. This one is a stock, which is measured at a point in time. So you can find even a question on assignment, multiple choice, looking for this dif difference. But just to illustrate something, for illustrative purposes, you can see that uh, if you think of, okay, just don't mind my drawings, but let's look at this as a sink. 
Okay, so this is a tap uh, through which water can flow into a sink. And then at the bottom of a sink, you have an outflow of water. So we can say income can be a salary, can be wage, can be profits, can be anything that flows into your stock of wealth. And then obviously there will be some expenses that will be flowing out. So we are saying now, if your income is greater than your expenses, obviously the stock of wealth will be increasing over time, right? But if your expenses are greater than your income, then it means that this stock of wealth will be depleting, okay? But this is a very clear illustration of what we mean by the difference between stock and income or flow, okay? Stock and flow, right? So we define money based on the function that money performs. So the best way for economists to define money is to look at what it does. So the definition of money is based on its functions. So what are those functions? There are three main functions of money. Number one, it is the medium of exchange. By medium of exchange, we say it is used to pay for goods and services. So it is a medium through which payments can be made, right? So uh, it promotes economic efficiency by minimizing the time spent, spent in exchanging goods and services. If you want to see the purpose of money or the function of money as a medium of, of exchange, think of an economy where we have barter trade. When you want to make a payment using barter trade, you have to look for the good that the seller needs, right? So you have a multiple transactions. You take your commodity that you have, you sell it to the person that has something that the seller wants. And then finally, you take that good to the seller. But with money, it is generally accepted. Therefore, it can be used as a medium, medium of exchange, right? So what about unit of account? A unit of account, you are saying money is used to measure value in the economy. Remember, in the butter economy or in the butter trade uh, scenario, what we are saying is that we measure the value of goods based on other goods. If it's a computer, we say, how many cell phones can we sell a computer for? Or how many, um, uh, how many cows does one need to buy a car, right? So here, now we are using money as a unit of account, something that we can use to measure the value of goods in the economy, okay? You understand this? Uh, you can think of a unit of account. Remember, uh, when we are measuring uh, weight, we use kgs or we can use a, what do you call this? A scale to measure uh, weight. We can also use a ruler or a tape measure to measure length, something like that. But for, for the wealth or the value of goods and services, we need to make use of something, which is what we're calling here a unit of account so that we can see the value of goods. Right now, if you go walk into a shop and ask for the price of bread, you are told it's 16 rand, which means that's the value of that particular commodity. So money allows us to measure the value of uh, the value of goods in the economy. So we take it or understand it as a, as a unit of account. What about the store of value, which is the third uh, fundamental uh, function of money? People can store their wealth in various forms. So others choose to store their wealth in form of money. So it is a repository of purchasing power over time. Instead of um, purchasing all the income that you are earning per month, you can save some and then uh, allow it to be used at a later stage in life. For example, someone can save for their holiday in December right now. That's, you are using money as a repository for purchasing power over time. Okay, so without money, then it would mean that people would store their wealth in various forms. So all these aspects, they constitute money. But we are going to see uh, the, 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 the most proper definition that we can come up as a result of this. But when you're looking at money, these are the functions that we are generally talking about. So this function is mainly affected by inflation. This store value, remember in an economy when inflation is very high, uh, people would not want to store their wealth in form of money. Otherwise they would choose to store their wealth in form of goods, valuable goods, okay? so. When there is hyperinflation in the economy, you'll find out that this function of money will be affected. Okay, so of the three functions, it is 
Its function as a medium of exchange is what distinguishes money from other assets such as stocks, bonds, and houses. Right? Remember, all these are assets. Stocks are assets, bonds are also assets, and even houses are assets. But we can't use houses to make purchases, right? They are not generally accepted as a medium of exchange, as a, as a means of payment, right? So of all these functions, you can, you can use, of course, your house to store wealth, right? Your bonds to store wealth. Stocks can be used to store wealth, right? Also, even you can measure probably the, 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 the value of a good in terms of uh, houses or any other asset. But we are saying of all these three functions, it is the medium of exchange which distinguishes money from all other assets that you can think of, right? Because it is a medium of exchange. It is accepted generally by everyone in settling payments, okay? Very important, you should understand that. Let's look at, because now we have looked at money as uh, defining it. And the most common function that we've noted so far is money as a medium of exchange. But before we go further in discussing money, let's look at the evolution of the payment system. How did the payment system um, developed from early uh, aspects of payment systems? So you can all agree that, um, okay, let's see that if uh, to have a better picture of the functions of money, it is good to look at the evolution of the payment system, the methods of conducting transactions in the economy. This is the payment system. How do we conduct payments in the, in the economy? So you can think of way back in that um, uh, traditional economy in which there was commodity money. By commodity money, we are saying we are using commodities to buy other commodities, right? So now we are saying for any object to function as money, it must be universally acceptable. Everyone must be willing to take it in payment for goods and services. Right, but the disadvantage of using commodity money, of course, we understand that there are so many disadvantages. But it could be heavier to carry around uh, if you are using commodity money. So that's the uh, number one weakness of having commodity money because uh, maybe if you want to buy a car, you need to move around with about ten cows and make that purchase. So therefore, the commodity money. Um, the use of commodities as money was abandoned uh, through the development of what, of what was known as fiat money. So what is fiat money? Fiat money is paper currency that is decreed by the government as legal tender. It is lighter than commodity money. So we can all agree that um, fiat money is, I'll give you an example to say, do you think 20 rand is actually uh, valued at 20 rand? Like to say, the material that was used to manufacture 20 rand, is it actually worth 20 rand? Or it's way less than that. So you can see that it is the government that decrees to say, this is now the legal tender that can be used to make payments, right? So it's a decree that is made by the government to have such a paper to function as money, right? So fiat money, you can Google this and find more on what fiat money is, right? but it's a degree that is made by, by the government. The history of the development of fiat money was that back then gold was used as, 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 a, as a medium of exchange in which people were uh, uh, making payments using, using, using gold. But the disadvantage was that the development of, of, um, of gold coins that were purely gold, not these ones that we are having now, purely gold. The disadvantage was that people would say, okay, after receiving payments, they would decoin the coins or they would dismantle and take the gold then resell it instead of uh, keeping on circulating the currency. The problem was that there was shortage in the currency because people were keeping the gold instead of keeping it, uh, in, instead of allowing it to circulate. Therefore, the government, back then, the governments of uh, those guys who started manufacturing currency, they decided let's bring up fiat money whose value, actual value is less than the the, 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 that, that is decreed by the government. So you can see that the first value of a 20 rand or a 50 rand or 100 rand is not its actual value. Otherwise, if it was like that, people would destroy that currency and sell it somewhere instead of using it as currency. But you can read an interesting story about fiat money. After that, there was now a development of, uh, of checks. Okay. Are we still using checks in South Africa? 
uh, checks still use, use yes used. sir yes sir okay but if you read i think checks have been phased out in SAC as of january or february 2021 if you I, I would need you to go and find out on this yeah that's correct most it's of true. the banks don't accept they don't yeah. accept checks so you can see that it's a move it's a development from commodity money fiat money to checks but now we are at e-money so what is a check a check is an instrument instruction to your bank to transfer money from your account to someone else's account when she deposits the check i hope most of us or a few among us here understands how uh checks work but i would want you to go and read on the disadvantages of each of these uh uh the, each of these payment systems because uh these checks had multiple disadvantages that resulted in their in them being phased out especially here in south africa as of 2021 right so go and find out on the disadvantages of each of these payment systems it can allow you to see the direction of where we are going so e-money this is electronic money this form of e-money uh was the debit card many exist only in electronic form so money doesn't exist in real uh form but it's only only electronic which can be transacted using computers uh mobile phones smartphones etc but remember uh there has been a debate on whether or uh, is the world ready for a cashless society in which no cash is used because everything will be electronic do you think this is possible is this a feasible move for us to have a cashless society but i'll leave you <clears throat> i'll leave you to debate this after the class where if you can see that south africa is it ready to have a cashless society right think about the rural areas infrastructure in the rural areas does it support cashless society okay so every payment system there's a development so you can see maybe after iman the, there's going to come another payment system again after this but are we headed exactly for 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 for, for a cashless society that's a question that you can answer right so <clears throat> let's have a definition of money in south africa let's have a definition of uh okay nt and clemens are trying to get in right okay let's try to get them in but they uh thing is that normally we would want the registration process to be done before the class starts so that we don't have interruptions okay All right it would affect the progress for the day okay just hold on Okay, so I think uh, next time, guys, just make sure that you make the registration before the meeting starts because uh, everyone should be approved in the meeting. Uh, if you get the link, you have to register. Then it is the admin that is going to accept you into the meeting. So it's for those that have made their successfully made the deposit and payments, right? So let's move on to uh, have an analysis of the the definition of money in the context of south africa so you can say for practical reasons economists have decided to define money as currents notes and coin plus deposits which are positive balances that are held in bank accounts which means our m which represents money would be called to cash which is currents in circulation plus deposits so this definition focuses on money as a liquid asset okay but it is not perfect Okay, how is it not perfect? 
approaching money in this manner would mean that then we should include certain forms of credit within this definition of money. Unfortunately, not all forms of credit is money. What do we mean by this? We are saying money is defined as currency and deposits, right? But if you approach money in this manner, it means that there's also need to include other forms of credit, which are within this definition of money. But they are not, not all forms of credit are, are, are money, or not all forms of credit is money. Let's look at that in detail. The first form of credit that facilitate exchange is the credit cards held by customer. But can we say credit card is money? Credit cards are not money. They are just a, a, a means of making payments, but they are not necessarily money. Look at this. Uh, this is the first, which are credit cards. The second important form of credit that is not counted as money is trade credit, selling goods on credit. Because remember, with credit, you are, you are allowed to make a transaction even before the, uh, the, the, the cash is settled, right? So can we say that uh, trade credit is money or can we say credit cards are money? No, they are not money, okay? So these two forms of credit are not referred as money, are not referred to as money. You should know this and you should read further upon this in the textbook so that you understand what we are talking about. Why do we say these are not money? Because these forms of credit allow the immediate exchange of goods, though, although they require payment at a later stage. Because with the credit card, you can buy something now, you can enjoy something now, and then payment will be made later. The same applies with trade credit. So because, okay, sorry, but because these forms of credit do not lead to an increase in cash or deposits, the money stock, what is money stock? This is money, which is cost to see credit, uh, currency in circulation plus demand deposits is not affected by any of the two. There is no effect of credit cards on the stock of money. Because what we are simply doing, you are bringing future consumption to today, allowing you to consume something you could have bought in future and you enjoy it now. So there is no change in the currency in circulation and demand deposits. So please read on the question why these two of forms of credit are not included within the practical definition of money. You can find a question that comes that focuses on why these two types of credits are not included as forms of, of money. Right, let's continue now in terms of measuring money in South Africa. Remember we defined money here in South Africa and then now we want to focus on the measuring. Uh, depending on uh, the economy that you are looking at, you can have M1, M2, M3, and M4. But in the context of South Africa, we have M1A, M1, M2, and M3. So all these are forms of measuring money supply or money stock in South Africa. So what is M1A? M1A is monetary aggregate, which consists of cash, which are token coin and bank notes. Right, so which means this is currency in circulation, currency in circulation cash, plus check and transmission deposits held by the domestic, private, non-bank sector at commercial banks. You understand what this means? These are check and transmission deposits that are held by the domestic, private, non-bank sector at the commercial bank. So this is M1, which is the narrow, no, this one is not the narrow, the narrow definition of money comes as M1. Okay, so we are only including cash in circulation plus some demand deposits. Okay. Right, so now demand deposits are deposits that are convertible into cash upon demand. I was just defining demand deposits. So we are saying M1, so there is M1A, there is M1, the M1 money aggregate consists of M1A. So in Okay, just hold on. So what we are saying here is that M1 monetary aggregate, it consists of M1A, which means in this, in this M1, there is M1A. So we are adding M1A plus 
other demand deposits that are held by domestic private sector within the, uh, sorry, held by the domestic private sector with the banks, which is the narrow definition of money. Okay, so here is other deposits, demand deposits that are added to M1A. So what are those demand deposits what, or what are demand deposits in general? This can be uh, the deposits that are convertible into cash upon demand. It can be a salary that has been deposited into your bank account. Then you can demand it at any time. You can convert it into cash at any given time. So what is M2? M2 is a broader definition of money, which consists of M1. So in M2, there is M1 and M1A. So it consists of M1 plus de deposits, which are almost money or near money. So they are not exactly money, but they are near money. Okay. So you should research on what is near money. It also includes short-term and medium-term deposits. Remember, demand deposits, you are convert them into cash at any time. But short-term and medium-term deposits, you have to give notice upon uh, before withdrawal. So these are short-term and medium-term uh, deposits, which includes savings deposits, savings bank certificates, and share investments. So in M3, again, which is the most comprehensive measure of money includes in addition to short-term and medium-term deposits, long-term deposits held by the private se domestic sector with monetary institutions. So you should be able to distinguish the difference between M1, A, M1, M2, and M3. Obviously in M3, there is M2, but in addition to what is in M2, there, is, there are now long-term deposits that are held by the private uh, domestic sector with monetary institutions. Right, so this is it on learning unit three. We, there's not much that you need to understand, but we have summarized the most important aspects that you need to know as monetary economists. So now let's move on to learning unit four, which in which we want to understand interest rates. Interest rates, what are interest rates? So. As monetary economists, we look at interest rates in two different ways. One, it can be viewed as the return on investment. Two, it can be also be looked at as the cost of borrowing or the cost of using money. Okay. Remember, if you are a borrower, you borrow money from the lender, and then at the end, at the maturity date, you have to pay the owner of the money, the uh, principal amount plus interest payments. So in this case, you are being penalized for using someone else's money. So that's the cost of using money. Right, so in this module, we are likely to look at interest rates first as a cost of borrowing. Then maybe later we would uh, allow, open it up and allow it to be viewed as the return on investment. But at the moment, let's look at the interest rates as the cost of using money. Right, so now, um, in measuring interest rates, we understand that different debt instruments have very different streams of cash payments to the holder, okay? Which are known as cash flows with different timing, okay? You understand that uh, if you are a bond holder, there is an owner of the bond, someone who issued the bond to you. And then the holder of the bond is the in actual sense is the, the lender. Because remember when you're issuing a bond, it's like you're borrowing from someone because you're giving someone a paper that shows that you owe someone money. Therefore, if you are the bond issuer, you are the one who is issuing the bond to a lender and then the lender will give you cash. Then periodically you can make some payments and to the holder of the bonds, those are cash flows. So we need to understand how this works. So we first, need to understand how we can compare the values of one kind of debt instrument with another before we see the interest rates, uh, before we see how interest rates are measured. So in this case, the concept of present value is, is applied. We can borrow this from some of the uh, mathematical or financial modules that we've done so far. Present value is cost to future value or cash flow divided by one plus R to the power N, where we are saying one plus R, this is your your interest rate, N is the time period. Maybe it's one year, two years, three years, etc. But for you to, you are discounting future cash flows. Bring them to today's 
to today's value, okay? How much is a dollar end next year worth today? So we are discounting future cash flows, okay? So why is it that we need to understand uh, interest rates? Because remember, from basic economic principles, we know that a rand received today is better than a rand received to tomorrow. So if someone promises you to give uh, you 100 rand today, and they say, I can also give you the same 100 rand next month, it's better to take it now because you can earn interest on that rather than getting it in future. You are making an opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. So that's why we need to know interest rates and you need to measure them and see how uh, we can compare the value of different debt instruments that perhaps have got different time maturity dates. Mm -hmm. Right. So we are not going deep into the mathematical computations of this. You just need to know, understand uh, how we can uh, make use of the present value approach or present value concept to um, uh, understand interest rates. Okay, so we are not allowed to do, we are not, not allowed, but you're not uh, mandated to know the calculations. So let's look at the four different types of uh, credit market instruments. These, you need to know them and understand them in a more detailed manner. So in terms of timing of their cash flow payments, there are four basic types of credit market instruments. What are those? Number one, we have a simple loan. A simple loan, the lender gives the borrower um, lender gives the borrower with an amount which must be paid at maturity debt with some additional payment of interest. So we are saying a simple loan, you come to me, then I give you some cash, and then at the maturity, maybe I promise you to say five months, you must, be, you must repay. So at the end of five months, you pay me my initial principal amount, additional interest payment. That's a simple loan. Fixed payment loan or a fully amortized loan. This is a periodic repayment of a debt. For example, you can have a mortgage loan or a, an auto, uh, automobile loan. Remember, with that, you pay some uh, periodic repayments of debt until the entire debt is, is repaid. So that's called a fully amortized loan or fixed payment loan. Then we also have what is known as coupon bond. Okay, so this coupon bond, it pays the owner of the bond uh, a fixed interest payment, which are known as coupon payments every year until maturity date when the specified final amount, which is the first value or par value is repaid. So it's like maybe for instance, you uh, borrow, um, you, 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 you issue a coupon bond, 5,000 runs, then every year, the owner of the bond, okay, or the bond holder, the holder of the bond, they would receive inter fixed interest payment, maybe it's 100 runs per every month or per every year, until the maturity date, when now the final amount, which is the first value, is repaid. Okay, so this is a coupon bond. So if you want to visualize a coupon bond, think of it in this manner. It was named because the bond holder used to obtain payments by clipping a coupon off the bond and sending it to the bond issuer who then sends the payment to the holder. That's why it was called the, the coupon bond because the, the bond holder would have uh, sort of some coupons and then those coupons will be uh, loosely attached to, um, to, to, to that bond. And then when payment is due, you just clip off the coupon and then you send it to the bond issuer who would make a payment. And then when all these coupons have been paid off, you receive the final amount. The discount, a discounted bond, which is known as a zero coupon bond, uh, is bought at a price that is below its first value at a discount. And then the first value is repaid at the maturity debt. That's why it is called a discounted bond or a discount bond. Why? Because it doesn't earn coupons. What happens simply is that uh, you get, for instance, let me give you an example, an example, a very simplified example. If it's a coupon bond, that is with the first value of 100 rands. Then if it is, uh, if it's a coupon bond, that is good. If it's a discounted coupon bond, sorry, I'm mixing up terms here, but you're saying this is a, a, a discounted 
bond. Né? So a discounted bond, if it's worth 100 rand, it will be sold at 90. And then on the day, on the maturity day, it will be so it will be repaid at 100. You understand? So hence it's called a discounted. Sorry, so it's known as a discount bond because uh, it is sold at a price that is below its face value, which means it is discount and the face value is repaid at the maturity date. So unlike a coupon bond, a discount bond does not make any interest payment. It just pays off the face value. Think of an example that I've uh, just illustrated uh, for you. So these are the four types of credit market instruments, right? Simple loan, fixed or amortized loan, coupon bond, discounted or discount bond, which is a zero coupon bond, doesn't, does not earn any form of interest payments. So we must know these markets, these types of credit markets instruments. Right, this section again, it is very important that you understand the maturity and the volatility of bond returns, uh, interest rate risk. Volatility of the bond returns is what we term interest rate risk, right? So remember, uh, over time, there tends to be volatility in bond returns. Therefore, the longer the maturity of a bond, the more volatile uh, is likely to be the, uh, the returns. Right, so that's what we refer to as interest rates. The volatility in the interest rate uh, is likely to affect the bond the bond returns. Right, so in general, we're saying prices and returns for long term bonds are more volatile than those for shorter term bonds. Right, so changes in interest rate make investment in long term bonds quite risky. So this is the conclusion overall that you need to come up with after reading the section that focuses on the maturity and the volatility of bond returns. The conclusion, the bottom line is that prices and returns for long-term bonds are more volatile than those uh, for shorter-term bonds. And therefore changes in interest rates make investment in long-term bonds quite risky to take, to undertake. Right, another important aspect that we need to understand in this module is the distinction that exists between real and nominal interest rates, right? Uh, so far, we've been referring to interest rates, interest rate, but we, we were not specific about, are we referring to real interest rates or are we talking about nominal interest rates? So now let's factor in another aspect of inflation into the, into the, um, into the equation and see the outcome that we can come up with. So we have ignored the effects of inflation on the cost of borrowing so far, which means we're just analyzing nominal interest rates. So nominal interest rates are those interest rates that make no allowance for inflation, right? These are nominal interest rates, but real interest rates, the interest rate that is adjusted by subtracting the expected changes in the price level, which is inflation. So we can come up with an equation, which is known as the Fisher equation. The Fisher equation tells us that Nominal interest rate is equal to real interest rate plus inflation expectations. So it means that if you are given the nominal interest rate and you are given the inflation expectations, you are able to calculate the real interest rate. Obviously, if you make R the subject of the formula, it means that you can say real interest rate is equal to nominal interest rate minus inflation expectations or price changes expectation. So this type of inflation uh, is also termed ex ante real interest rate because it is adjusted for expected changes in price levels. Ex ante real interest rates because they are adjusted after. Uh, uh, sorry, be because it is adjusted for expected changes. So this is before price changes. So that's why we call them ex ante real interest rates. We adjust based on expectations. So the ex and real interest rate is most important to economic decisions. And typically, it is what economists mean when they make reference to real interest rate. They are referring to the ex ante real interest rate. There is a difference between ex post real interest rate and ex ante. Let's see that real di difference and what 
uh, difference does it, does it make whether you're referring to ex ante interest rate or ex post interest rate. So if the interest rate that is adjusted for actual changes in the price levels is called the ex post real interest rate. So this is the level of interest rate that is adjusted for the actual changes in inflation or price level. This is adjusted for expected changes. This one is for actual changes. What has happened already? That's why it's ex post real interest rate. So it describes how well a lender is done in real terms after the fact. You understand what we mean here? Okay, after. This is before because we expect. So the real interest rate is more accurately defined from the Fisher equation named for Ivan Fisher. So Ivan Fisher says interest rates, real nominal interest rate, sorry, is equals to real interest rate plus inflation expectations. But you can rearrange, play around with this formula and develop, make anything the subject of the formula after this. Right, so let's see. This one is an assignment for you. Explain why a low interest rate provides more incentives to borrow, but fewer incentives to lend. Why is it like that? We can, you can, you, you, you may not answer this in this class, but think of it and come up with a possible explanation of why, if we have lower real interest rates, there will be incentives just to borrow, but fewer incentives to lend. It's quite clear and general. I will not answer it now. Think about it and then come up with a possible explanation, but it has something to do with the cost of borrowing. Right. So uh, remember what the, the main purpose of us doing these classes. We are not saying these classes are a substitute for people, uh, substitute for reading. After the class, take your uh, textbook, take your uh, internet sources, your study guide. Try to read on what the, uh, we were saying in the class so that you don't cram, but you know exactly what is happening. This is for you to have a direction of where we are going, right? Because no matter how much I try to explain, if you don't also read and play your part on your side, it, not, it is not gonna work. So it's, it needs combined efforts from both sides. I do my part and then you also do your part. Um, okay. So it's just like um, doing any investment that you can think of, uh, be it be them relationships or anything, you need to water them to make sure that everything uh, is proper. So at the moment, what we are doing right now, we are giving you a foundation and a clear picture of uh, the direction that we are taking. But I would encourage you to, to read and uh, understand more in detail after the class. And also, if time allows, try to answer the questions that comes after each and every learning unit and see how much of the content you are understanding, okay? So please, that, that's my advice as of now. So some might think that it's too early to start preparing for your, uh, for your exams, but if you start now, you can be better off. So this is learning unit five, where we are looking at the behavior of interest rates. Behavior of interest rates. So on behavior of interest rates, the most important aspect that you need to know before you can look at the behavior of those interest rates, let's look at the determinants of asset demand, of an asset demand. What are we looking at when you're looking at the determinants of an asset? If you have done any um, preliminary economic module, like for example, 1501, you understand factors that determine the demand for a good. And you can think of that as your price of the good, price of substitutes, price of complements, your income, population, etc. So the same also concepts apply here. We want to determine what explains demand for an asset in the economy. So there are various four main factors that can provide an explanation for the demand of an asset. So <clears throat> if you are doing economics as a as a as a economics as a as a course or as a what can I say as a as a degree, at one point you are going to do econometrics. And the theories that we are doing right now 
in some of these modules, whether it's monetary economics, it's uh, international trade, international finance, all those theories in econometrics, you'll be now applying them because the module assumes that you know most of those theories. So when you're doing these theories, try to capture them and master them so that if you're doing any other module, you should be able to apply the concepts that you have learned in other uh, supporting modules. So let's look at the determinants of uh, the demand of an asset. <clears throat> Number one, we have wealth. So what do we mean by wealth? Remember we said wealth is a stock. So it can include your bank balance, the cash in hand, it can also include the assets, other assets that you're holding, the, the bonds that we have bought, the, uh, the what else, stocks that we've purchased, ETC. We can sum all that into your, your wealth, your stock of wealth. Okay. So wealth, holding everything constant and increasing wealth raises the quantity demanded of an asset. It's obvious that the more in, uh, the more wealth that one has, the, the more purchasing power that that person has. And also, uh, it can afford to purchase more assets or more of an asset. Okay, so uh, wealth is self-explanatory. Self we also have expected returns. An increase in an asset is expected return relative to that of an alternative asset, holding everything else constant. This is Ceteris Paribas. We assume that all the other effects are held constant. That raises the quantity demanded of an asset. Let me repeat that again. An increase in an asset is expected to return relative to that of an alternative asset. Holding everything else constant raises the quantity demanded of that particular asset. So if you expect that, uh, if we expect that the expected returns or the relative uh, returns of particular assets are going to rise, then people can demand more of the asset now because obviously you'll be expecting to earn more uh, returns on that particular asset. So expectations play a role in the determinants of demand of an asset. Risk is well another aspect as well that determines the demand for an asset. So assuming everything is constant, if an asset's risk rises relative to that of alternative assets, it, its quantity demanded will fall. The basic assumption is that most people are risk averse, thus prefer to hold, hold less risky assets. Okay, so the more riskier an asset becomes, the lesser uh, quantity demanded of that particular asset would be. Okay, liquidity as well. What is liquidity? Liquidity is the um, okay. Someone can answer. What is liquidity? Just a quick one, we don't want to waste much time. What is liquidity? Someone? Okay, no one. So- uh, The ability of an instrument to be converted back into cash in my humble view, sir. Yes, thank you very much. So it's the easiness of converting an asset back into cash. Okay, so the more liquid an asset is relative to alternative assets, holding everything else constant, the more desirable it is in the greater will be the quantity that will be demanded. Understand what we mean here? We are saying the more liquid the more liquid an asset is, the more of that particular asset, the more quantity of that particular asset will be demanded. So let's look at this table that we have just extracted as it is from the textbook. So we are saying a response of the quantity of the quantity of an asset demanded to changes in wealth, expected returns, risk and liquidity. So this is a summary. So we are saying here wealth if wealth increases Quantity demanded of that asset increases, expected returns, relative expected returns increases as well, one-to-one -one relationship. Then here, risk relative to others, assets increases, then quantity demanded of a particular asset fall, liquidity relative to other assets, then um, uh, quantity demanded of that particular asset would also increase. So this is it. So there's a note here where we're saying only increases in variables are shown here. We are talking about increases, but the effect of a decrease of the variable on a change in the quantity demanded would be the opposite of what we have illustrated here. Here we have just shown increases in all these variables, but you can look at it in form in the, in, in, um, when there are declines 
in all these variables. Right. Another, so remember when we started this section, we said uh, we want to see the behavior of interest rates. So in doing so, we need to understand the determinants or the, 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 the determination of interest rates. How do we determine interest rates? All right, so um, sorry. So what we are saying here, uh, okay, I see there's uh, someone on WhatsApp who's saying I can't hear. So please, if you are able to go on WhatsApp and tell those that are not able to hear the sound, if they are using a mobile phone, please tell them what to do. They just go on the bottom left of the uh, screen, then they click on, uh, on the microphone icon, and then there will be two options that will come the allow call over internet. They click that option so that I won't uh, be able to uh, make more delays in completing today's session. So if you can please help them or even help them on the chat box, that would be helpful. And that will be much appreciated instead of uh, us stopping the class to attend to those that are not hearing any sound. Right, so here we are looking at the equilibrium determination of interest rates. And we have two forces here, then we have the bond supply and bond demand. This is just a, the um, classical uh, demand and supply for a product. But here we are looking at bond demand and bond supply. All right. So we can see that as usual, bond supply is upward sloping, bond demand is downward sloping. So we understand that uh, at this price of a bond, there is an excess supply of the bond. And thus, if there is excess supply, which means uh, too much of the bonds are on the market. Therefore, the price of the bonds will go down from 950 until they reach the equilibrium of 850. At any price of a bond that is below equilibrium, we all understand that there is excess demand for the bond because demand is greater than supply. If, and if that happens, it means that there will be an upward pressure on the prices to increase the prices to increase. So prices will increase until they reach an equilibrium at C. So here there is excess supply, here there is excess demand. So these two forces would keep the bond market in equilibrium. But there is an important aspect, guys, that you need to know is that there is a negative relationship between bond prices and interest rates. You can see that at a lower bond price, interest rates would be very, very high. As the bond prices increases, the interest rates would start to fall. I hope you can see what we are trying to say. I would leave you with a moment. Why do we have a negative relationship between the bond prices and the interest rates? For those that are doing economics or those that are going to do econometrics, you might need to use this relationship. Why do we have bond prices negatively related to with interest rates. Do a research and <clears throat> discuss even on WhatsApp, why do we have a negative relationship between these two variables? <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so let's look at the changes in equilibrium interest rates. Let's look at the changes in equilibrium interest rates. What are we saying here? We are looking at the changes in equilibrium interest rates that come as a result of a shift in demand for bonds or shift in supply for bonds. Okay. <clears throat> so there are factors that we've discussed earlier on that can cause the demand of a, of a bond to shift to the right or to the left. So if it's wealth, we understand that in a business cycle expansion with growing wealth, the demand for bonds rises and the demand curve for bonds shifts to the right. In a recession, the opposite happens. When income and wealth are falling, the demand for bonds falls and the demand curve shifts to the left. Because remember, we said wealth is one determinant of uh, an asset. Remember, bonds are also assets. Therefore, 
if everything is going well in the economy, business is expanding, wealth is rising, incomes are growing, it implies that demand for bonds would rise. But however, in a recession, we are likely to face incomes declining, wealth falling, demand for bonds as well declines. And therefore, the demand curve would shift to the left instead of shifting to the right. Expected return. Higher expected returns in future lower the expected return for long-term bonds, decrease the demand, and shift the demand to the left. What are we saying here? We are saying if there is a, an anticipation that if there is an anticipation that uh, there will be higher interest rates in future, then there will be a lower expected return for long-term bonds, right? Which leads to decline or a, a fall in the demand for bonds now, and then shifts the demand curve to the to the left. Obviously, if you expect bonds to earn higher interest rates in future, okay, that would have um, that would have that would decrease the expected return for long term bonds which would shift the demand curve for bonds now to the left, okay? But lower expected rate returns in future increase the demand for long-term bonds and shift the demand curve to the left. What's happening here is that if you anticipate that interest rates on bonds is likely to be lower in future, okay? What do you do? You demand more bonds today. Okay, so this is about the expectations. And you can see how it affects both remember in this case interest rates we are looking at the interest rates as the cost of of uh, bonds cost of borrowing or the return on investment right so who demands the bonds and who sells the bonds if you understand that section it won't be a problem for you the bond issuer is the one who supplies the bonds the bond holder is the one who demands the bonds okay so you should be able to uh make sure that you understand these concepts. So risk as well, an increase in the riskiness of bonds causes the demand for bonds to fall and the demand came to shift to the left. This is self-explanatory. Liquidity, increased liquidity on bonds results in an increased demand for bonds and the demand came to shift to the right. Right, so this is very important. You must know changes in equilibrium interest rates. How is it impacted uh, by these factors, especially on the demand side? But also we have demand, we also have supply side of these bonds, which can also impact on the equilibrium interest rates. So the shifts in the supply of bonds can come as a result of expected profitability of investment opportunities, right? So if we expect profitability in, of investment opportunity as a company, what do you do? If you want to exploit the, profit, the expected profit, profitable investment opportunities, what do you do? You issue more bonds so that at least you can do, um, you can establish the business plans that we have, right? So that you can exploit the expected profitability investment opportunities. So what do you do? You issue more bonds. Therefore, the supply curve would shift to the right, which means an increased supply of bonds. But if you expect profitability of investment opportunities to go down, what happens? Obviously, you won't issue more bonds if you're a company. Because remember, your ability to repay the, 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 to repay the loan would be based on the profitability of those investment opportunities. So if the expected profitability of investment opportunities are low, then obviously you supply less bonds, okay? So it's, it's a matter of uh, linking these theories. What about expected inflation? If we expect a higher inflation in future, okay? Then it reduces the cost of borrowing. So as a, a company that is issuing bonds, what do you do? Now that the cost of borrowing is expected to be lower in future, what do you do? You issue more bonds now because you are going to pay less as, uh, in terms of interest rates. You, you remember the link that we had in terms of uh, real interest rates and uh, nominal interest rates. 
remember we said that nominal interest rate is equal to real interest rate plus inflation expect expectation. So if we make R the subject of the formula, it would mean that nominal interest rate, sorry, real interest rate is cost nominal interest rate minus inflation expectations. So therefore, if we expect inflation to be very high, it means that real interest rates would fall, which means you are going to pay less for the money that you've borrowed. Therefore, you can supply more bonds on the market. That's the illustration that we are talking about here. So generally, uh, government deficits or government budget deficit. What is a budget deficit? Can someone answer that one? What is a budget deficit? Government budget deficit. Um, it's when you collect um, less than you spend. Yes. So we are saying as now, yes, as a government, it's spending more. It's spending more than it's any in tax revenue. So now, how does a government finance its budget deficits? Government can also issue bonds <clears throat> to finance deficits. Therefore, if you are having higher uh, budget deficits or a greater budget deficit, what would be the effect on the supply of bonds on the market? Someone to answer that? Can someone answer? If we are having an increased budget deficit, what would be the impact on the supply of bonds on the market? Obviously, there will be an increase in the supply of bonds, sir, because yes. then government needs to sell more to make up for the deficit or the 100%. shortfall. Thank you very much for that. So it shows that uh, budget deficits are positively related with the supply uh, function, which means that if uh, there are increased budget deficits, then the supply curve for bonds would shift to the right because governments use bonds to finance those deficits. But if there is a surplus, what would be the impact on the supply of bonds, the opposite of that? <clears throat> right. So let's now have an application on the changes in interest rates due to changes in inflation. Right. So now <clears throat> what we are saying is that how does inflation affect the demand for bonds? How does inflation affect the demand for bonds? So if you anticipate a higher inflation rate in future, it expected inflation, a rise in expected inflation shifts the demand curve for bonds to the left. Okay? And then you need to understand why the demand for bonds shifts to the left if we are going, we anticipate high inflation, right? So now you have to revisit uh, the, uh, de the demand curve for bonds and the factors that we said affects uh, the, 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 the demand for bonds. Now you need to, uh, that's why we call it an application of what we have learned so far. So due to an, a rise in anticipated inflation, the demand for bond, uh, the demand curve for bonds would shift leftwards. After that, step number two, how does inflation affect bond supply? Remember we said inflation rate, if it's expected to be high, therefore the cost of borrowing in the form of real interest rates would fall. Therefore, companies, governments would supply more of these bonds on the market. So what would be the actual output, actual outcome of this? Step number three, causing the price of bonds to fall and the equilibrium raise interest rates to rise. Remember the relationship between bond prices and interest rates. If bond prices fall as a result of these in, uh, inflation changes, if bond prices fall, then it means interest rates will be rising due to the aspect of the relationship between in, uh, interest rates and price of the bonds. So I would want you to do a research on the changes in the interest rates due to business cycle expansion. This is in the textbook. You have to go and read and make sure you understand this diagram. So <clears throat> remember, I'm giving you a light and see how you should be able to present uh, the information in this uh, module. Right. So at the moment, guys, <clears throat> let me make this simple. We have made use of the bond market to determine equilibrium interest rate. 
There is another approach, which is known as the supply and the demand in the man market for money. So here now, instead of looking at the demand and supply for bonds to determine interest rates, <clears throat> now we are looking at the demand and supply for money, which is what we refer to as the liquidity preference framework or the liquidity preference theory. It was developed by Keynes and uh, <clears throat> it's a Keynesian approach to interest rates de determination. We have the classical approach, Keynesian approach, ETC, but we are not going to focus on the uh, schools of thoughts as of now. We just want to understand this liquidity preference theory or liquidity preference framework. Please pay close attention to this as this is very, very important for you as a monetary economist. So the alternative model to determine equilibrium interest rates is the liquidity preference theory, liquidity preference framework. So we can call this LPT or LPF framework theory. So it determines the equilibrium interest rates in terms of the supply of and the demand for money. So in contrast to the supply for, supply of and demand for bonds, here we are looking at the supply and demand for money. So the approach differ by assuming that there are only two kinds of assets, which is money and bonds. So we assume, according to, to Keynes' liquidity preference theory, we assume that there are only two kinds of assets, which can be money or bonds. So an individual can decide to hold their wealth in form of money or in form of bonds, right? It's an assumption. But in reality, of course, it's not uh, applicable. But we use this so that we understand what happens in the real world. So we are saying here, Keynes understood, understood money as, a, as currency and checking account deposits. So according to Keynes, these were the two uh, components that would form money, which in his time typically earned little or no interest. So according to Keynes, currency and so currency can be cash in hand or checking account deposits. So back then, these checking account deposits were not earning any interest, or it was insignificant to be considered. So Keynes assumed that money and zero return, rate of return. So if you're holding your cash, of course it's applicable even now, if you're holding your currency in, in, in physical form, you don't earn any return on that, unless if you deposit it <coughs> in a bank or if you invest it in an asset, which can be a bond in our framework. So now bonds, uh, which are the only alternative assets to money in Keynes framework. So we are saying bonds are the only alternative assets to money in, bond, in, in, in Keynes framework. So we have two assets, money and bonds. So either you hold your wealth in form of money or bonds. So we can also see that the quantity of money demanded and the interest rates should be negatively related by using the concept of opportunity cost. Let me explain this and make it clear for you. Right. Remember, there are two options here as an investor or as an individual. You want to hold your wealth either in form of money or bonds. But if you decide to hold your money in form of wealth, in form of uh, interest rates, sorry, let me repeat that again. If you want to, if you decide to hold your wealth in form of money, it means that you are not going to earn any, any interest. If you decide to hold your wealth in form of bonds, it means that you are earning a return, which is interest rate. So there is an opportunity cost for you holding your wealth in form of money. So which means the interest that you could have and had you invested in bonds. So now we are saying there's a negative relationship between interest rates and the demand for money. So if you demand more money, uh, so wait, if the interest rates falls, if there is a decline in the interest rates, you can have a relationship like this, demand for money, interest rates and quantity of money. You can call this QM. At a higher interest rate, at a higher interest rate, you can see that there will be a reduction in the demand for money because a person will decide, no, I can't keep on holding to money because I can earn better interest if I invest in bonds. So there will be a decline in the quantity of money demanded. So you can see that the interest rates increase from E0, I0 to I1. Therefore, <clears throat> there will be a reduction in the quantity demanded of money. But if you assume that the interest rate is declined, which means the opportunity cost of holding money is gone down, the implication is that the person will decide to hold more uh, money balances instead of investing in a bond that is earning 
lower interest rate. This relationship is quite important, especially for you as, a, as an economist or for you in understanding monetary economies, economics. So this is what you are saying, a negative relationship between uh, quantity demanded, quantity of money demanded and the interest rates based on the opportunity cost. Should be able to illustrate and explain this. So in this case, um, in this case, what we are simply saying is that <clears throat> opportunity cost is the amount of interest which is the expected return that is sacrificed by not holding alternative asset. In this case, a bond. So as the interest rates on bonds rises, the opportunity cost of holding money rises, thus money is less desirable and the quantity of money demanded must fall. This is the relationship. And now we can come up with the framework, <clears throat> the, the equilibrium in the market for money or the money market. Here we have our traditional demand for, for money. Then we also have the money supply. And someone would ask, why is money supply vertical? It is because <clears throat> money supply is believed to be exogenous. By exogenous, we mean it is not determined within this framework. It is set by the central bank. So it is the central bank that determines that money supply must be fixed at this uh, rent, at this value, which might be 300 billions of runs or something. So it is also the central bank that, has, that can say, let's increase the money supply to this rate or let's reduce money supply depending on <clears throat> what's happening on the market. So in this case, the application, the principles remain the same from your micro macroeconomics. If you want to determine equilibrium, what do you do? Take a point that is below equilibrium, take another point that is above equilibrium and tell us how do we get to this equilibrium. You can see that <clears throat> at this equilibrium right here, at this price, at this interest rate, sorry, we have excess demand for money. So if there is excess demand, for people are demanding more money, therefore the price of money, which is the interest rate, will start to rise because of excess demand, which is a shortage. So people will be willing to pay more to have cash balance. Here, we have an excess supply of money, which implies that there would be uh, forces there will be forces to, there will be forces that would force, uh, there will be forces that would be dragging the price towards equilibrium going to this side because demand is less than supply that is available. So basic principles will tell you that if you are having too much of a good on the market, its price would go down. Therefore, the equilibrium will be established where quantity demanded is equal to quantity supplied. So you should familiarize yourself with this diagram and make sure you understand it. Let's see changes in equilibrium interest rates, uh, changes in equilibrium interest rates in the liquidity preference framework. So we have shifts in demand for money. So we need to know what are the forces that explain demand for money, right? We said shifts in the supply curve are only engineered by the South African Reserve Bank. So therefore, according to Keynes liquidity preference framework, two forces can cause the demand curve to shift, which is income in the price level. Changes in interest rates would not cause a shift in demand. It would cause a movement along because this is synonymous with the price of, of money. So changes in the price of money would lead to a movement along the demand curve, not shifts. Two factors or two forces can only lead to shifts in the demand curve. One, price level. Number two, income. So let's look at how this can cause a shift in the demand curve for money. A higher level of income causes the demand curve for money at each interest rate to increase and the demand curve to shift to the right. Store of value and make more transactions. What are we saying here? We're saying that uh, as income rises, people's income rises, and then people would want to store more of their wealth in form of money, then they would demand more money. And also they would want to make more transactions at the same time. That's why we are referring to these two uh, issues, okay? So a rise in the price level causes the demand for money at each interest rate to increase and the demand curve to shift to the, to the right. This is a theoretical implication because, for example, if the price of bread was initially 15 rand and now tomorrow you wake up and it's 
30 rand. What is the implication of the demand for money? It means that you need more money to do the transactions that you were previously doing with only 15 rand. Therefore, price level and demand for money positively related. Income, demand for money positively related. Shifts in the supply curve of money is only engineered by the SARB, but in advanced, in advanced monetary economics, you would understand that money can also be viewed as endogenous, which means it is also determined by other factors apart from the central bank. But for now, we assume that it is fixed. It is not endogenous, but it is exogenous and determined by the SRB. There's a quiz for you, and please do it. You should be able to demonstrate diagrammatically how income and price level and money supply changes impacts on the equilibrium interest rates. For instance, I'll just give you a hint. Here we have demand curve, and then we ask, oh, sorry, I'm used to supply that is uh, about sloping, but this is your supply for money, and then this is your demand for money, and then if there is, this is your initial equilibrium interest rates. If there is an increase in demand for money, what would happen to interest rates? If there is a reduction in, what would happen to interest rates? Another aspect, for instance, if there is an increase in money supply, what would be the effect on interest rates? I will not explain that for you. You should go and read and understand those aspects. So uh, this is the quiz for you, and you should be able to demonstrate that using a diagram. The last thing that we want to look at today is uh, risk and term structure of interest rates. The purpose of this learning unit is to uh, describe why do interest rates on bonds vary. Number two, we also want to look at uh, the risk structure of interest rates. We also want to look at the term structure of interest rates. And then uh, three different theories that may be used to explain the characteristics of yield curves. Okay, so that's the purpose of this learning unit. And after the completion of this learning unit, we would come to the end of today's session. So that's why I was saying there's a lot that we are covering. But if you pay close attention to this, it can help you in uh, understanding. Right, so now um, let's get straight into this without time wasting. Let's look at the risk structure of interest rates. Interest rates on different categories of bonds differ from one another at any given year, and the spread or the difference between the interest rates varies over time. So there are two things that we are looking at here. We are saying that interest rates on different categories of bonds, right, uh, differ from one another in any given year, number one. And even the difference between those interest rates, uh, they also vary over time. I hope this is clear, okay? Interest rates on bonds differ from one another in a given year, number one. Number two, the difference between those interest rates varies also over time. So what explains that? You can see that the interest rates on municipal bonds, uh, these are your local government bonds, for example, they are higher than those on the US government treasury bonds because they believe that U.S. Treasury government bonds, they are less risky because the U.S. government, federal government, is always able to repay its bonds. I don't know how applicable <clears throat> this can be on the South African context in terms of... Uh, so I was saying, I don't know how applicable is this on the South African context in terms of how... Uh, how do we compare the interest rates on uh, national treasury bonds and the municipal bonds? I think you can go and read on uh, research on the interest on uh, South African treasury bonds and municipal bonds. But generally, <clears throat> it is the issue of risk here. Uh, <clears throat> using the American context, municipal bonds <clears throat> are more riskier than uh, U.S. national treasury bonds. Why? Because of the ability to repay the bonds, the, 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 the loans for the municipal. <clears throat> the national government, it all 
it is believed to be able to repay the, 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 the loans that it could have acquired through the issuing of those bonds. So let's look at what factors are responsible for this phenomenon. What are those factors that are responsible for this, the, these two phenomena that we have noted here? Because remember, uh, different bonds have got different interest rates. Why? <clears throat> Number one, default risk. Uh, Jacob has raised a hand. Want to say something? Yes, sir. Um, if municipal bonds are more risky, how come they are not backed by government considering that they in our case, it's a province within a government, within a country. How come it cannot be backed by government? Please, thank you. Um, on that one, I think it goes back to the idea of some degree of independence in terms of uh, the municipal operations in the national treasury. <clears throat> because in other contexts, you'd find out that municipal operations they are given some degree of autonomy in terms of the financing and uh, the operations of how they do, although they have some uh, intergovernmental transfers from the national government to support uh, local government uh, operations, but they are given some sort of degree of independence and autonomy in terms of their, uh, the issuance of bonds. Right, so you can find out that uh, that autonomy would determine the ability of the nation, the, 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 the local government to repay the loans. But as for the question of why does the national government or the national treasury, why does it not back up those bonds? Uh, I think we can uh, see uh, let me see here. Okay, is there someone who have got something to say on this? Yeah, it's a critical question, I think. But it's about autonomy. Yes, let's see. There's someone who have raised an issue here. I see. Thank you very much. Sir. So it's it comes on autonomy, in terms of decisions, in terms of financing, operations, and everything. And so if a municipal is good. Uh, too much autonomy, then they have uh, decisions that they do in terms of repaying the, uh, the, 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 the bonds, ETC. So number one explanation for the risk structure of interest rates is default risk. What do we mean by default risk? What is default risk? Uh, default risk, we can talk of the ability of a borrower to repay the loan. So one attribute of bond that influence its interest rates is its risk of default, which occurs when the issuer of the bond is unable to, unable, number one, or unwilling to make re interest repayments when promised or pay off the face value when the bond matures. So default risk, the issue of repayment, right? So when a company is making losses, it may suspend interest payments on its bonds. The US treasury bonds have usually been considered to have no default risk due to the ability of the national treasury to repay the bonds. So I would want you to check on South African uh, government bonds. Uh, can we call them, they, are, they, they, they have no default risk? Let's leave that for research and discussion again. Uh, let's research on that and see if South African bonds can be considered uh, zero risk, zero default risk bonds or default free bonds. So bonds like that with no default risk are called default free bonds. <clears throat> So there is a spread between the interest rates on bonds with the default risk and default free bonds. Both of the same maturity uh, is called the risk premium, which indicates how much additional interest people must earn to be willing to hold that risk bond. What are we saying here? We are saying there are two bonds, risk free bond or default free bond and, <clears throat> and a default risk bond. Default free bond, and default risk bond. So obviously, for someone to purchase a default risk bond, for example, a municipal bond, there should be a risk premium, <clears throat> which is an additional interest that the purchaser of that bond must earn to be willing to hold that risk bond. 
you understand this, the, this is the interest spread between these two types of bonds. So that's why we are saying <clears throat> there are different interest rates for different types of bonds. Another issue again is liquidity. We're saying US Treasury bonds are the most liquid of all long-term bonds because they are so widely traded. Corporate bonds are not as liquid as we can compare them with the national treasury bonds because fewer bonds for one corporation are traded. For any one, for any one corporation are traded. Thus, it can be costly to sell these bonds in an emergency because it might be hard to find the buyers quickly. Why is it that you, it might be difficult to sell the corporate bonds? It is because of the inability. Uh, it is because of uh, the issue of liquidity. Even when someone buys that bond, it might be very difficult for them to find another uh, a person who might be willing. If you, at the end of the maturity period, want to resell the bond to someone else, then it can be a problem again. Okay, remember, bonds are tradable. Okay, so corporate bonds are they are not they are illiquid compared to uh, treasury bills. It all comes back to the ability to convert them into cash. These are widely traded. These are uh, not widely traded. So how does the reduced liquidity of the corporate bonds affect their interest rate relative to the interest rate on treasury bonds? So here, <clears throat> what do you think would be the outcome of the reduced liquidity of corporate bonds uh, on the interest rate? So remember, we talked about liquidity is one factor that determines the demand for a bond or of an asset. So now if the liquidity of corporate bonds is reduced, which means there will be a leftward shift of the demand for bonds, for corporate bonds, and therefore interest on bonds, on corporate bonds would be higher than <clears throat> that on, on municipal, on, 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 on national treasury bonds. Let's have this. <clears throat> I'm actually doing the assignment for you, the one that I had given you. I wanted you to go and research on how does the fall or the reduction in municipal bonds affect the interest rate. So assuming that here, this is the initial equilibrium. Then if there is reduced uh, liquidity on uh, corporate bonds, what would be the impact? impact? Leftward shift of the demand curve, correct me if I'm wrong, then Remember, here we don't have interest. It's price, no? price of the bond, P0 to P1. And remember, there is a negative relationship between interest rates and, and price. So now if price of the bond falls, interest rates would increase. So you can understand that uh, the reduced liquidity on the corporate bonds would mean that interest on corporate bonds would be higher than that of uh, default, free bonds or or uh the what do they call, what do we call them okay these are default free bonds yes default free bonds so interest on corporate bonds obviously will be higher because we are saying uh someone might be must be compensated for taking a higher risk on that's why it's called risk premium <clears throat> so you can use the, the the demand and supply for bonds analysis the theory of portfolio choice to, to, to answer this question. You can get it in the textbook, of course. Right, remember we are looking at those aspects that cause interest rates to be different for different bonds. Another aspect is in income tax considerations. We are saying if a bond is a favorable tax treatment as do municipal bonds whose interest payments are exempted from federal income taxes, its interest rate will be lower. Municipal bonds generally <clears throat> or theoretically, interest payments on these municipal bonds, they are exempted from federal income taxes. So if that's the case, then the implication would be that the interest rates will be lower for municipal bond bonds, yes. So these are the three aspects, default risk, liquidity and tax considerations. That those are the explanations for the risk structure of interest rates. Risk structure, we are looking at um, 
restructure we're looking at the interest rates on bonds on the same term maturity is affected by their risk. That's the risk structure of interest rates. So there are three explanations for that, default risk, liquidity, income tax considerations. Let's look at the term structure of interest rate. By term, we mean the maturity, term to maturity. So we are saying term to maturity structure of interest rates. So another factor that influences the interest rates on, bond, on a bond is its term to, to maturity. Bonds with identical risk, liquidity, and tax characteristics may have different interest rate because their time remaining to maturity is different. You understand what we mean here? So a plot of the yields on the bonds with differing terms to maturity, but the same risk, liquidity, tax constant. So we are holding all these constants, the other factors that we analyzed previously. So the result that we come with is what is known as the yield curve. So I would allow you to go and to search further on what a yield curve is. But the simple definition is that it is a curve that plots different uh, the, the yields of on a bond with or against different terms to maturity, but having the same risk, liquidity tax considerations. Yield curves can be classified as upward sloping, flat, or downward sloping. The last sort is often referred to as the inverted yield curve. By an inverted yield curve, it is abnormal because normally it should be upward sloping, showing that longer or, 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 or longer term bonds have got higher interest on them. But if now we find out that longer term bonds have got lower interest rate on them, then we refer to that as an inverted yield curve. So when yield curves slope upwards, the most usual case, the long term interest rate is above the short term, uh, above the short term interest rates. Remember. If we plot a graph like this, if we plot a graph like this, here we have term to maturity. Obviously, you can say one year, two years, three years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, or 30 years. Let's say 30 years here. This is the, the term to maturity. And then you can have a curve that can be uh, about sloping like this. And then here you have your, your return. So we are saying normally it's upward sloping, implying that it is positively related and uh, longer term, long term bonds have got higher um, return than short term bonds. That's what we are saying here, diagrammatically. So we are simply saying when the yield curve is slopes upwards, which is the most usual case, the long-term interest rates are above the short-term interest rates. Clear that. Then when the yield curve, curves are flat, then the long-term and short-term interest are exactly the same. We can all agree that if the curve is flat like this, which means no matter the, 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 the terms to maturity or the term to maturity, the, interest, the, the return on, the, on that bond still remains the same. So when yield curves are inverted, long-term interest rates are below the short-term interest rates. So three theories have been put forward to explain the term structure of interest rates. That is the relationship between the relationship among interest rates on bonds of different maturities reflected in yield curve patterns. So let's look at these th three theories before we conclude today's session. So these theories, you must know them. And I'm going to give you a clear direction of what each theory says, but it doesn't mean that you are not uh, uh, going to, go, uh, to to research further on each of those theories. Okay, so let's start with the first theory, which is the. Okay, so this is an example of a yield curve. It tells you the maturity, and then the interest rate on this other side. The theories that are used to explain terms, the term structure of interest rates. Theory number one is the expectations theory, two, the segmented theory, and the liquidity premium theories. So each of these will be described in the following sections. So a good theory should aim to explain the following empirical facts. So each of these theories, for it to be a very good theory, it must be able to explain the following empirical facts. So these are facts that we see existing in the market but we now want to see the validity of each of these theories. So for them, for each of these theories to be very, very valid or very good, they should be able to explain the following 
three aspects. What are the following empirical aspects? Number one, interest rates on bonds of different maturities move together over time. That's a fact. They move together over time. They might be different, but they move together. Two, when short-term interest rates are low, yield curve are more likely to have an upward slope. When short-term interest rates are high, yield curves are more likely to slope downwards and be inverted. We have looked at this and we've shown you the diagram. Yield curves almost always slope upwards. So these are the three empirical facts that we have to explain using the expectations theory, the segmented markets theory, and the liquidity premium theory. So I'm giving you a light, guys, and I would be very much happy if you go and read on this on your own. Right, so the segmented markets theory can account for fact three, which is fact three. This is the fact, fact three that we are talking about, but not the other two facts. Where, where am I, sorry? Okay, sorry, let me read this. The expectation theory does a good job on explaining the first two facts, one, two, and on our list, but not the third, this one. Now the segmented theory can account for fact three, but not uh, the other two facts, which are well explained by the expectations theory. So if the liquidity premium theory, which is this one, does a better job of explaining the facts and is hence the most widely expect, accepted theory, why do we spend time discussing the other two? Why can't we just go straight to the liquidity premium, liquidity premium theory? Why is it that? You should find out why. But I'll give you a hint. <clears throat> Normally, in economics, we use uh, foundations upon which we can build better theories. So the first two are used as foundations for us to understand the third, more applicable theory, which is the liquidity premium theory. So I've given you a hint on that, but there's another reason again, why do we start the first two when the third one is the most applicable to real events, to real facts in the world? Let's start with the <clears throat> expectations theory. Okay, let's just break for just a minute and then we we'll just resume now. Right, so taking it over and uh, about to finish off, I think by uh, 1945, we must be closing. So the expectations theory is the name itself. Expectations is about expectations. Uh, so the expectations theory of the term structure of interest rates states that the yield on financial assets of different maturities are related primarily by market expectations of future yields. So the interest rate on long-term bond would be equal to an average of the short-term interest rates that people expect to occur over the lifetime, uh, over the life of the long-term bonds. Let me repeat this to make it clear for you. So according to the expectations theory, the interest rate on a long-term bond would be equal to an average of the short-term interest rates that people expect to okay over the life of the long-term bond. So people, if they expect that um, uh, the interest rates on short-term bonds would be 10% in the coming five years, then the expectations theory predicts that the interest rates on bonds with five years to maturity would be 10% too. So if people expect short-term interest rates to be 10% on average over the coming five years, then the expectations theory predicts that the interest rates on bonds with five years to maturity would be 10% as well, because it's an average of uh, an expectation of the use for the following five years. Okay, so it's 10%, therefore, bonds that have got 
uh, that matures in five years will be having a yield of or interest rate of 10%. So the average short-term rate interest rate over the coming 20 years, now let's assume that is now 11%, then the interest rate on a 20-year bond will be equal to 11%. Are we together there? Yes, we must be together. So let's go back a bit and see if we are still on the right track. Remember, the expectations theory does a good job on explaining the first two facts on our list, but not the third. So expectation theory doesn't predict that they are always upward sloping. Okay. So that job now is done by the segmented market theory. So let's look at the segmented market theory. The segmented market theory, as the name suggests, um, believes that or assumes that or sees markets for different maturity bonds as completely separate and segmented. So that's why the name segmented market theory. So therefore, the interest rate of each bond with a different maturity is then determined by the supply of and the demand for that bond with no effects of the expected return on other bonds with other maturities. So we are saying, if you are looking at bond A, if you want to determine the interest rate of bond A, we are just looking at the demand and supply for bond A without any effects of the expected returns on other bonds. You understand what we are saying, how this theory differs from that of the uh, market expectations, expectations theory. So this one, markets are segmented. If you have bond A, bond B, bond C, then it means that we have markets for bond A, bond B, bond C. So the key assumption is that bonds of different maturities are not substitutes at all. So the expected return from holding a bond of one maturity has no effect on the demand for a bond of another maturity of A. Yes. So we are saying these markets are segmented completely. They are separate. Uh, uh, what happens in another market does not in any way affect what happens in another market because of uh, the assumption that they are not substitutes. So this theory of the term structure is at the opposite extreme of the expectation theory, which assumes that bonds of different maturities are perfect substitutes. So by doing so, we are able to differentiate between the market expectation theory or the expectations theory and the segmented market theory. Right, so this is because investors have a strong preference for bonds uh, of one maturity, but not for another. So, which means if you prefer bond A, uh, according to this um, theory, you won't have preference for any other bond. So therefore markets are segmented according to this theory. The liquidity preference and the preferred habitat theory. The liquidity pre premium theory, liquidity premium theory of the term structure states that the interest rate on a long-term bond will equal an average of short-term interest expected to occur over the life of the long-term bonds plus a liquidity premium, okay? So I think if you look at this, you can see that there is some sort of ex expectations there and also averages. Uh, so if we think of this, we can see that maybe it's a combination of expectation theory and the market segmentation, but let's see if this is true. So we are saying uh, uh, the interest rates on long-term bonds will equal an average of short-term interest rates expected to occur over the lifetime of a bond plus liquidity premium, also referred to as a term premium that responds to supply and demand conditions for a bond. So this is a Remember this, only this is the expectations theory that we have, and then responding to supply and demand conditions. That's what this theory tells us, segmented market theory. Responding, our interest rates are responding to changes in supply and demand conditions in a particular market. So the theory's key assumption is that bonds of different maturities are substitutes, which means that the expected return on one bond does influence the expected return on a bond of different maturity. So you can see that this theory differs from uh, the segmented market theory in that it assumes that uh, different mature bonds of different maturities can be substitutable. Therefore, what happens in the uh, in one market of a, in, 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 a, in bond A can affect also what happens in 
uh, another bond of different maturity, closely related to the liquidity preference theory, premium theory, sorry, not preference. Liquidity preference theory is by Keynes. This is the liquidity premium theory, is the preferred habitat theory, which takes a somewhat less direct approach to modifying the expectations hypothesis, but comes to a similar conclusion. So what is this preferred habitat theory? It assumes that investors have a preference for bonds of one maturity over another. A particular bond maturity, which is, would be a preferred habitat, a preferred home in which they prefer to invest. So that's why they call it preferred habitat theory. So because they prefer bonds of one maturity over another, they will be willing to buy other bonds that do not have the preferred maturity only if only if they earn somewhat higher expected return. So basically the, the, the preferred habitat theory assumes that a person would prefer a category of bonds which are known as or a particular bond maturity, which is known as the preferred habitat, preferred home in which they prefer to invest, but they can only buy another bond if and only if they earn somewhat higher expected return. So the conclusion here is the premium, liquidity premium that an investor would earn, given that they bought a bond that is out of their preferred maturity or preferred habitat. So at the end, you would see that you would come up with a diagram like this, in which we have the interest rate here and then the different terms to maturity. So the expectations theory assumes that <clears throat> the curve would be horizontal because this is just an average of uh, short-term interest rates in the next 30 years. So it will be a, just a single figure, maybe 30%, 5%, 3%, constant. But the liquidity premium, which is what now leads us to the liquidity premium or preferred habitat theory. This is the premium that we are talking about, which leads to an upward sloping uh, <clears throat> upward sloping yield curve. Okay, so you can get this question in your exam. You can get it maybe in your assignment. I don't know, but I remember last year there was a question that came on any of these three theories. Okay, so remember if the exam is open book, of course you can just open your book and then try to paraphrase any point. But if it's a okay, uh, let me finish on the aspect that the exam is. Um, is, uh, is, is, is online. It's good if you're in the exam that you know where to find what, rather than someone who is seeing the thing for the first time. You don't know even where the liquidity premium, liquidity premium or uh, preferred habit theory is found. That would be a problem because if you had read before the exam, you know, okay, so this is chapter six, I think. Let me go and just browse through and see the best way of putting this theory in a most uh, appropriate way. But if you are seeing the thing for the first time, then that would be a challenge. So that's the purpose of us doing these classes. You have to know, okay, this thing I made it in class, I know. If I want to explain it, I can explain it in this way. Okay. So this is your uh, your three theories, and we have summarized the two here on the on the diagram: expectation theory, yield curve, and the liquidity premium theory, yield curve again. Mm -hmm. Right. So now we have come to the end of uh, our session today, and. Uh, now it's 1948. I think we are, we are within range of our time because we don't want to be, um, uh, we don't want these classes to be above two hours. They become boring and the others would uh, end up getting confused. But what is to follow in our next lecture? We are going to cover Lending Unit 8, 9, 10, and 11, if time allows. So, which means uh, during that time, uh, the following section will be prepare the notes for, for, the, for the classes and then you can we can have our session same time next uh, week again and those that haven't paid please make sure to honor remember we said uh it's only 500 and this is the cheapest rate that we can get uh and we've done this given the conditions that are on the market COVID 19 has affected a lot of things so uh, at least people have to learn and understand concepts at the same time you also have to make uh, the commitment to settle the uh, promised price, which is only 500, right? So we are going to look at this next week. And uh, remember each time you join this meeting, you have to be registered on time, maybe a day before, 
so that during the meeting, we don't want any interruptions that would disturb us. If you are failing to log in or to sign in to Zoom, you can communicate with the admin, then they can help you on time and not when the meeting is already in progress, because that would be an, a disadvantage for those who are we have come, who, who they have come early for the meeting. So next time we'll share the link before the day of the meeting so that people can register. And if you haven't paid next time, it means that the admin would not approve you into the meeting because they would see every login and every sign in uh, that will be happening. And those that are registering, Rotony uh, hand is up. Yes, sir. I'd just like to know the minute you send through that link for us to register, can we do it there and then? Uh, sorry, can you come again? Uh, I'm saying the, the moment you send out that email to register for the meeting, um, can one then immediately do the registration? Yes, there and there. Okay, good. Thank you, sir. Yes, it's good. To, actually, if you get the, if you inbox you the link, click on the link, just go. It won't take you even one minute to do that registration process. But a lot of learners, they have a tendency of trying to register when now it's six o'clock and it will not work. If you face any challenges regarding register, because remember all the people should be admitted in the meeting before the meeting starts. So now when the meeting starts, uh, now you have to be admitted, which means you have to pause the meeting a bit and then admit others. But where it's fine, next time the link is sent, register on time, then you are approved in the meeting. Then uh, we move on. Any other questions? Say assignment, uh, assignment is learning unit one to six. We will be able to look at the assignment in class. So at the moment we have covered learning unit one to six, which means even at uh, your at your free time, you can start looking at those questions. But we have a discussion together on this assignment on assignment one, so that uh, whatever you could have uh, researched, we now compare with what we might come up with in class. So yeah, now you are able to answer assignment questions. So start working on them and.